Hey, it's Deep Focus. I'm your host, Mitch Goldman. This is part two of three parts of a program recorded Monday night, January 9th, 2023. If you really, if you really want to do this, be authentic in your Deep Focus listening, start the programs Monday at 6 p.m. But you don't need to do that. You can listen anytime you like. If you didn't hear part one, I'm going to recommend that you do go back and listen to it. It ended with Brian and I just starting to touch on the topic of his association, musical and personal, with the astonishing musician Joey DeFrancesco, who died very suddenly um, and way too young, not too long before we made this recording. And Brian speaks uh, very, very affectionately for Joey and what was lost. And I'm just very grateful. I got to see this ensemble that these two guys had two organs on stage. Oh my goodness. So much music at one time. Oh man. You got to get out and hear the music when you can. That's one of the great lessons here. Okay, here we go. Part two of three parts. Brian Charette on the topic of Jimmy Smith. And a little sidebar here on the brilliant Joey DeFrancesco. It's deep focus. Like Joseph, play the organ, you know. And we became really good friends, especially in the last year of his life. We were working together a lot, and we're going to do some more things. So such a huge loss. And, you know, his wife is such an incredible manager. She was like the tour manager for... Um, his gigs and she was the most professional tour manager I ever worked with I know his mom and dad um, we just played together in the early summer at uh, Musical Instrument Museum in uh, Arizona oh no kidding yeah I just had a whole conversation about that place. so this was the last time I saw him we were talking together and then he was gone yeah you know so yeah that was a that was a fantastic night I don't think I'd ever seen two organs on the same stage to begin with and the two of you guys man there was so much music coming out of it that's right you came to see us at yeah. the forum i forgot about yeah. that uh-huh and uh he was phenomenal i hadn't i realized it probably had been 20 years since i'd seen him play live he looked fantastic he looked never better never that's better. why this was so shocking and he's like oh and by the way let me leave this instrument that I've mastered like no one has ever lived and play a saxophone. No, trumpet yeah. solo. No, <laughs> I'm going to sing. I mean, it, was, it was just like... <laughs> he was really something. Wow. He was... Uh, I've never known a person gifted with music like that. You know, it was really something to be around him. It was really something. And he made me feel very close, you know, and especially when his mom and dad were there. Um, when I would see them at like the trade shows in, in California or when I saw them in Arizona. And uh, we spent a week together in Switzerland last year, too. We were with uh, Anwar, who played drums on this show that you saw, and Peter Bernstein played guitar. And we had incredible organ rigs for a week in, uh, in Bern at a place called Mary Ann's, where we got to play, maybe it was six nights, uh, a year ago, September. And uh, that was incredible experience. Yeah, he and yeah, he showed enormous respect. And well, we were friends. We were you. friends. Yeah. You know, it was. Uh, it showed. I mean, it came through very clearly. No, we enjoy. I think we enjoyed each other very much. I think we're very different in the way we play organ. I would say, you know, um, and I think a lot of people try to match Joey, which is impossible to me <laughs> technically. And I would kind of go the other way and I think that was why I enjoyed it so much because it got me to try to investigate this very different side of of playing like I would use different stops and uh, the juxtaposition to me was was pretty interesting you know yeah well I mean you know he's just playing so much yeah he's, you know, he's so, like, tremendous where, organist I, I so, would just think for you being on stage with him the challenge you know it's terrifying it's obviously terrifying <laughs> because he sounds like that well i didn't mean that but yes but he was so gentle and encouraging to me you know um all with every it was always super cool hang and we'd just be talking and sharing ideas not even necessarily about music and it was a real family atmosphere you know 
which I will really always cherish. So mm. it was a great honor to, to, to have played music with him. Yeah, no doubt. Well, yeah. thank you for life changing sharing it. Yeah. We had a great time. I was there with Jim Newman. Yeah, that was a great. I, I love that place, the Jazz Forum. It's a cool club. Um, is that Terrytown? I think so. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, yeah. yeah, incredible was, memories. Yeah, I'm glad I caught a little chapter of it. That was a very special moment for me. Right when uh, that was also right when COVID was kind of cresting. Oh. Yeah. Can you believe that? It's still going on. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Crazy. Um, But not here in the studio, WKCR, and not in Sal Playel in Paris in November of 1968. Jimmy Smith holding it down with the trio with Nathan Page on guitar, Donald Bailey on drums. Jimmy Smith has probably, we were figuring without even looking or counting, maybe 50 albums plus, all of which... You probably could find, if you really tried, Mm -hmm. rounding up LPs and whatever might be available, digital downloads, CDs. Mm -hmm. He certainly played through into the CD era. and uh, But you might not find this recording. This recording is from the WKCR archives. You've probably never heard it. And you're hearing some things. If your notion of who Jimmy Smith was as a musician is sort of cast in amber of of, – a kind of a genre or subgenre and a style unto its own, you're not really getting under the hood. He's subtle too, though. He sneaks it in there. You know, the, everything, all of the blues, all of the things from the early period are still there. And then, you know, curveball. Yeah. And he keeps coming up with more and more stuff. And it was interesting, something you said, maybe you can unpack it a little bit, that it's not. It's not really a huge vocabulary. I think this, of all great jazz guys from Charlie Parker to, I mean, now, like young people, when they learn jazz, they have a lot of different things that they're into. But I feel like you got to remember, there was no YouTube. There was no, a lot of this stuff, there was no owner's manual to it. It was not codified. Even what they were playing on the records were kind of, it was kind of spoken about after, you know. Um, so these, he must have just been around contemporaries who were in this kind of stuff. He must have been friends with all these guys. I'm sure he's friends with Larry Young by this time, right? Sure, he must yeah, be. I would imagine. Or know him or be into what he does. I'm sure he was into it. Um they were label mates at Blue Note uh-huh. early on. But, so, I mean, Larry Young, he, boy, talk about a guy whose style evolved. Right. I mean, he sounds totally different from, is that the first record with the bricks on the cover? I'm not picturing the cover, but his, he made some early records that... It sounded totally different yeah. from what he sounds when he starts to play this kind of modal approach. Yeah. And, and he's also, he's, you know, Joe Henderson and that stuff. Yeah. Not to mention, by this time, maybe he's already uh, not, I don't think... White yet doing the Tony Williams lifetime stuff. Mm-hmm. But, no, that's a little, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's working all of these new ideas into his really fully formed style. And they I don't know if this is true, but they told me that he got a warehouse, got an organ, and just locked himself in there for like a couple years to develop these kind of techniques, which would become his first stuff, which was very blues and bebop oriented. Especially coming story. from Charlie Parker. And we were talking about not not a lot of material, not in any kind of negative way, but these guys, especially thinking of Charlie Parker, they had 10 to 20 ideas that they could just turn on their head, start it in any part of the beat, play it in any key. But the building blocks weren't infinite. It was a small amount of material that they would really hone so they could use it in their approach. To music, and that's what I think about Jimmy Smith. This is especially apparent to me when I was reading my friend's dissertation on him, because he'll take these old solos and just break them down. Here's the Champ blues lick, which you hear like 50 times in the Champ, and sometimes it'll be inverted, and it's maybe 10 or 12 things, pieces that he's using, which to me is many less things than people who improvise now in jazz are thinking about. It's just interesting. Yeah, very interesting. You know, you're kind of like just giving yourself a very set 
very set parameters and you're staying, I don't want to say you're staying within them in the way that they're not taking chances, but it's not like, oh, I'm going to sound like this guy now, or I'm going to do this thing, or I'm going to play symmetrical scales of all Olivier Messiaen, or I'm going to, you know, it's not that. Here's another thing that's changed since the time of this recording, 1968. So Jimmy Smith's putting these records out at this, I think that this time he's still with the Verve. They're big, big records. Some of them have like big production. Mm-hmm. And the material, there was a common language of songs. Mm-hmm. These are really, these are pop tunes, a lot of this music that he's playing. And, you know, this might be a set from an organ gig that I will play tomorrow. <laughs> like, they still play all of these songs. And they were, and these songs at the time, I mean, some exceptions. You're going to hear, uh, he's going to do Satin Doll in this next set, which is you know, kind of more of a conventional jazz standard. And um, certainly, whether it was Misty or old folks, either mm-hmm. way, it's a it's a jazz chestnut, even by 1968. But um, a lot of this music, you know, would be the equivalent maybe of like a Taylor Swift song today, but even more so because as hugely popular as someone like that is, it's not – something that everyone knows and uh-huh. grandma and grandpa will tap their toe to, uh-huh. which was very much the case with these songs. They uh-huh. were like monster AM radio hits, hits and, yeah. and common language. Mm-hmm. And, but of course, you know, he's finding all these new things to do with it and bringing, making them into Jimmy Smith songs. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's obviously brilliant at playing this instrument, which is not easy to do, you know, just the pedals alone, like moving your limbs like that for any a period of time is physically very demanding. So, and he would always be in a suit too. You know, I wear a suit, but it's like, I, I'm pretty wet by the time I'm like, and I kind of have to take my jacket off. Like, I don't know how he would stay dressed like that. Um, I don't know how anybody does it. Um, I picture, I'm trying to remember, I spent a little bit of time around him. And I picture him being kind of a wiry. He was wiry. Guy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty Um, thin, pretty strong. Very energetic. Um, Very constantly moving and and flowing. He was kind of a a jokester, too. You know, he would be just. Yeah, he really was. (laughs) Did you know Lonnie at all? Lonnie was very much like this. It was different. Yeah. And Lonnie was very gentle and soft spoken, but he would, you know. Lonnie Smith. Yeah. Like, he would sit down next to me and not look at me for, like, two minutes and just sit there. And then he would put his cane on my foot, you know. <laughs> and he had these sayings that he would say, you know. Like, he'd tone, he'd slowly turn to you and say, I hate you. <laughs> or, you owe me money. <laughs> Everybody has a story like this who was friends with him. Um, but he was also a terrific, incredible artist as well. Very influenced by Jimmy Smith, as all of these guys were. Jack McDuff, Jimmy McGriff. Yeah, couldn't not be. I mean, yeah, I could you, only you imagine. Could not be. They played basically the same drawbar setting. And so did Larry Young, but Larry Young changed the chorus setting, which made it a little more intense sounding. So Jimmy Smith used C3 vibrato, which is kind of the most popular vibrato to use on an organ in a jazz context and i believe larry young used c1 which is kind of a little more intense narrower bandwidth of tremulant maybe but still coming from jimmy smith and if you listen to him on the older records before like unity and stuff it's it's very influenced by jimmy smith to me yeah yeah that's a you know it's very interesting looking at this music, listening to this music over the long span of time and the idea of changing the sound of an instrument. And some of these instruments, uh, you know, some of the electronic keyboards that you play are only emerged during your adult lifetime. Uh And some of them might go back hundreds of years, Mm -hmm. sort of thousands of years, or, you know, somewhere in between. And the kind of drive that it takes and creativity to change the sound not just for yourself but for everybody who comes after you mm-hmm. it's a that's its own kind of magic that a very few people bring sure and i don't know what it was like then but you know sometimes people are very resistant to um 
you trying to change the sound of yes, an instrument. That's true and too. it can be met with you know, even my albums that are more trying to stretch the sound have been, you know, I get a little heat for that. Yeah. So I could guess. I, I, Jimmy Smith doesn't seem like he was. He probably didn't care too much. <laughs> but when he came out, it was such a, you know, I also think that those, I think you could, people were looking for new sounds. That's a, good a little point. bit more than than now. That's good, but yeah, but not you know, to pigeonhole now either to say that there's no new sounding things. And don't try to tell me that there were no moldy fig jazz heads. I'm in sure there were. I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were. Someone told me Giant Steps got one star on Downbeat. Is that true, <laughs> or it got a not a great review? But yeah, you know, to be an innovator um, like him, I'm sure it was not an easy thing to do. You have to have a really strong sense of self, which is not an easy thing to have. Yeah. 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 It's, I think we got a revelation here in this recording from Sal Playel, Paris, 1968. And we've got just a couple tracks left. Should we jump back in? I think so, because I like these ones a lot. What are um, they? I got my mojo working. Um, funny lyrics. And Satin Doll, um, where we might get to hear him do some squabbling, which is this organ kind of chordal playing that he, to me, very much uh, invented or codified. McDuff does it a lot, too. It's got kind of a glassy texture. The percussion is still on, but the first draw bar is pulled out in the last four, and it gives it kind of a swirly chordal kind of vibe. I like it. I like it. Right, hold on now. You know, I've got this thing with this uh, trying to uh, doing a little, got a little innovation, we'll call it. <laughs> of how we're presenting these recordings. Um, but uh, thanks for staying with us. Okay, so last two pieces on this set. The show's Deep Focus. I'm your host, Mitch Goldman, here with Brian Charette. And it's WKCR, and we're at Sal Play El Paris, 1968 on WKCR. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Oh, 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 I can't believe that worked. Well, I got my mojo show what And I'm gonna try it on you, baby. What I say, baby. Got my mojo show what baby. And I'm gonna try it on you, baby. What I said, baby. When I tried New York City, you gon' give me a chance on you, baby. Yeah, what I said, got my mojo showing, baby. And I'm gonna try it on you, baby. Yeah, you better get your rug later, baby. I got my mojo showing, baby. And I'm gonna try it on you Yeah, I'm gonna try it on you Yeah, I tried New York City You gonna give me a chance on you, baby I'm gonna work my roof, baby Well, I got my mojo working, baby, and I'm 
gonna slide on you, baby Yeah, you bet you get your rug laid away Well, I tried New York City Well, Lord, I you gonna know what you said uh, Yeah, gonna with your mojo, baby Well, I got my mojo Mojo working I got my rug laid Working on you, baby I got my mojo Joe working with me now. And I'm gonna try it on you, baby Oh, what I say, baby Well, I tried New York City Oh, Lord, you gonna give it on me That's how they do it. <laughs> That's how they do it. A little two minutes of just the set and doll. Mm -hmm. Little shades of Ella Fitzgerald, of whom we spoke, and Count Basie, mm -hmm. and so much else. That's a, a live set. If you missed it, well, you will actually, you know what? A week from tonight, it's going up on the Deep Focus podcast. Of which I'm a fan. I'm so glad. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, you can find it on your favorite podcasting app on that phone in your pocket right now. If you don't see it there, you can always find it at the hosting site, which is mitchgoldman.podbean.com, mitchgoldman.podbean.com. And uh, there's hundreds of episodes, many of which feature Brian Charette, well, some of the past shows we've done. A few at least. At least a few. How many have we done? Six. I, you put me on the spot. But I'll tell you what. You can look it up. You can go to a different website, uh -huh. mitchgoldman.com. Uh -huh. And if you pull down the tab about deep focus, mitchgoldman.com, pull down about deep focus, there is a search bar, a Google search bar. And if you put your name in there. Oh, my God. I love to do that. All no, the episodes totally are kidding. on. I'm totally we did that. We did that great one. One of the, my favorite. Keith Emerson. Yes. This is a big one. That was like a kind of surprise. Whose big dude was Jack McDuff, by the way. Uh-huh. See it all. Rock Candy was with Keith was Emerson's. Keith, em, Keith Emerson had some crazy stories Man, about I told you that I got to play with him, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. He had some hilarious stories about Jimmy Smith. I'm sure. Actually. I don't want to speak out of school for him, but uh -huh. you can look him up and um, see some of the things that he had to say. And um, But, yeah, so Deep Focus. Uh, so, yeah, next week this one will go up. It's all free, just like on WKCR. No advertising, no tip cup even, no nothing. Giving it all away. And, uh, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of shows on there. Deep Focus. 
come find that. And Brian, I want to ask you, man, what do you got coming up around uh, here and elsewhere? You are always grass does not grow under your feet. Well, you know, I was traveling a lot in September and October, so I've been mostly playing in New York for the last little while, but I'm going to go, uh, I'm actually playing one New York show on piano, which is uncommon. Uh, I'm going to play at Mesro on February 1st, and then I'm going to go to Los Angeles for a couple weeks, and I have some cool shows there. I play with kind of a fusion band with Danny Carey and Jimmy Vivino and Doug Webb. We're going to play at the Baked Potato in L.A. on the 9th of February. And I'm going to play three different concerts at The Grape in Ventura, which is a really cool place. Um, and there's going to be kind of a West Coast version of the Sextet. I think David Binney is going to play. Um, I'm going to play with Doug Webb there. And then we're going to have some kind of keyboard summit, which might have Scott Kinsey, um, a lot of cool L.A. Mitch Foreman keyboard dudes that I've become friends with since I've been going there. So it's going to be a real nice trip. Uh, and I've been, you know, I just turned 50. So I've been trying to take it easy so I can stay alive for a couple more years. Oh, come on. Um, Hard well, to believe your your boyish globetrotting self. Uh, well, you know, I have been trying to uh, travel a little bit less because it's really it's really a lot to travel now. Have you been traveling? No. Oof. No. You know I used to. You know, it's a lot better than it was. I was doing it. I was basically traveling as soon as you could. And I would have to get roadside COVID tests in Spain. Oh. And it was like pretty hairy. Yeah. So uh, I've been trying. I love to play in New York, too. There's a lot of great places and great people here. Um I will go to Europe a bunch in the summer, though. I'm going to be uh, I'm going to play an organ festival in Switzerland in uh, Basel at a place called the Bird's Eye. They have a cool organ festival there. I'm going to play in Berlin at a place called B Flat, and I go to the Czech Republic a lot and Slovakia. So I'm going to you know I'm going to be traveling a lot. In, I knew it. In the I knew it. You're trying to tell me. Well, for this, for in the winter, I try to write music and I try to keep it, you know, not travel so much because it's also winter. And when I would do tours in the winter, it would be just logistically or canceled or snowing. Right. Sure. For the plane, I would, you know, it would. I usually don't tour too much in January to March. Yep. And you told me you did a just did a classical performance. I just played. Man, I work with this amazing orchestra called the Modern Art Orchestra in Budapest. And I actually, last year, I met um, the gentleman who runs the orchestra teaching in Prague with him 10 years ago. We became friends. Last year, I wrote a piece for his brass orchestra, and we played it in Budapest. And this year, they played a late mass from Franz Liszt called Via Crucis, which is basically the Stations of the Cross, and he brought in four soloists. So I had my B3 on the altar of St. Stephen's Basilica and was kind of dueling with Andras, the amazing organist, pipe organist of St. Stephen's Basilica, and we had two amazing sopranos as well, and we played this 1879 Franz Liszt mass, and it was what an experience that was. So yeah, I'm hoping to do something with them also. I'm trying to write some music for that group as well now. So, you know, very exciting times for me artistically, I have to say. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be able to just, I mean, I don't really work. You know, I just go around and go la, la, la. And it's like pretty good. <laughs> Figured something out, man. Do uh, If people want to follow what you're doing, buy your music. It's very easy to find. You just put my name in any kind of search engine. My website is briancharette.com. And I'm also easy to write to. I'm friends with a lot of people um, who are just enthusiastic about the organ and just have a question or whatever. I mean, obviously, within reason. But uh, I'm very accessible in general. Brian, B-R-I-A-N, Charette, C-H-A-R-E-T-T-E. Say my name. Brian Charette. <laughs> Brian Charette. Uh, here's a question I've never asked you. Uh -huh. Have you ever had an opportunity or welcomed the opportunity to play one of those 
big honking pipe organs. Totally. As a matter of fact, I've played a 300-year-old Silberman organ who played who designed organs that Bach would play. Wow. Where so was that? So that was in I always mispronounce the name of this place and there are two different places. It's in Fre- Freiburg, Germany. It's about 2 hours from Berlin. And that is where this big or he was very famous pipe organ maker and this organ I played was like 300 years old and you know the gentleman I was working with David Nicholson super cool oil painter in Berlin but he also has this kind of alternate kind of punky band that we play in in Berlin and I love it and I'm very good friends with the guys and he rented out this medieval church where kings are buried and made like kind of a scandalous music video in there like I was dressed up like a pimp on the (laughs) organ and they kind of have this you know I don't know how he did it, to be honest, because it was like smoke machines in this like medieval church and uh, pretty frisky subject matter, I would say. Uh huh. So, um, well, isn't that where all that stuff comes? I from? guess so. <laughs> but uh, so I play. I actually used to play in a bunch of churches in New York. From Leon, who is how we know each other. Yes. Leon Gruenbaum, mm-hmm. of course, who plays with Vernon's groups. Um. I started like 15 years ago to play pipe organ in church services, which I really enjoyed. And I played on that in that big stone church on Bleecker Street, Our Lady of Pompeii, which has the same organ in there as St. Patrick's Cathedral. It's a Kilgan organ. Wow. And the biggest thing about the organ is, you know, some of them can be in a tough state of repair. Yeah. And they have a big wind box. And in the old days, like when you see the Silberman organ and you go to the museum in Germany, there would be people in there like rats on a maze, like going yeah, up and down to, gener- to generate the air. Yeah. Now they have these big wind boxes. But uh, this organ on Bleecker Street is a great sounding organ. But sometimes he would just freak out in the middle of a mass. And most of my... Learning how to play pipe organ was learning how to get it to stop, you know, making some crazy sound just because it's just going off on a tangent. It's a mechanical, wind-driven. So I'm not like a very experienced pipe organist, but at this point I've played a little pipe organ and am not completely unfamiliar with it. Pipe organ has a very slow attack compared to a Hammond organ. So in that way, it's very, very different. Well, and I would think that's actually very fitting with the kind of acoustic environment that they're engineered sure. to be sure. played in. But it's difficult to play. And this organ, uh, you know, I became very good friends with the organist at uh, St. Stephen's, and he's incredible virtuoso classic, uh, classical organist and a specialist in Franz Liszt music. Um, and, you know, this mass was very interesting. It's written very late in his life. And... It's very pastoral and serene, which is very not like the transcendental etude. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Franz Liszt. Uh, um, we're talking about Franz. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So transcendental etudes, if you listen to earlier Franz Liszt music, is very technically difficult. And, you know, we I have a broken finger on my right hand, so I can't play really technically difficult classical music, but I managed on this uh, okay uh, and it was a great experience. And the interesting about the modern art orchestra is they will play the music, but then on certain sections, they will blow out certain pieces of the arrangement that can have uh, rescoring or some things have improvised parts. So it might even be a little scandalous for purists of classical music, but I find it very stimulating and interesting, you know. Um, yeah. So that was that was my experience with pipe organ music this year. Yeah, the show is called Deep Focus. I'm your host, Mitch Goldman. Brian Charette is with me, and we are zoning in on the one and only incredible Jimmy Smith, and specifically these late '60s live performances that uh, KCR archives delivered unto us. And we're changing gears only because we ran through that whole Paris session from '68. Where to? Can we do the one 
um, from London. Oh, you, that's a little we not try. the greatest. No, we don't do it. Don't no, do it. Don't I do have it. To, uh... Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> the only reason is because this group on this, maybe the listeners can try to find this uh, YouTube German documentary that has this band because it's so interesting. And Billy Hart is playing in New York. I love that. You know, I love that. now and sounding killer. You know, All right, I'm going to try to keep keep talking because I need a minute. Uh, full disclosure. Our um, CDs didn't burn, <laughs> which can happen. We had a little, this is the home of technical difficulties. I didn't know that would follow me back to my house. <laughs> you know, which CDs is- are t- they're tough. Sometimes I'll even have a release from a uh, you know some record that I have. Someone buys it and it doesn't play. Not Oof. not really the new ones, but CDs are. They can be a little. They can burn. The speed that you burn them sometimes makes a big. Uh, Maybe I don't know. If that was it. Um, multiple efforts. I've got the the stuff you're talking about, though. Yeah, I but am, I don't. You know, if it. No, if, it's uh, cute. It's, it's cute up. Are you sure? Oh, it is. Just because this band is the same band in this very interesting German documentary, and you kind of get to see them vibing with, with each other, and I feel like you can really hear that in the music. Um, and you know, being in New York City, Billy Hart is still playing great here. Um, I've never spoken to him about it. You know, I've heard him play a bunch, but I wrote to him the other day and I'm like, oh, my God, Mr. Hart, I was just watching you again on this amazing video. And Quentin is playing a Stratocaster in the video, too. I don't know if he's I don't know if he's playing a a Stratocaster here, but that's kind of an unusual choice. Well, uh, so this is 19th January of 66. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Stratocaster had a little different connotation. And I love Stratocaster, but. You Didn't never you used to play Stratocaster. I play. I still play Stratocaster. Yeah, I haven't seen you pick up a guitar in years. I still do it. I used to do it more. Um, I, you know, I've just been so busy with the keyboard music that uh, my other instruments, I, I haven't kept them up in the way that I did in the past. But um, this is this band is in this video and i when i listened to this music i really thought and austin my friend that i was telling you about before sent me the video a couple of days ago because i was talking to him and i said i was going to come on the show and he sent me the video and it's really in the time period that we're talking about and you get to see jimmy smith and the guys arriving in the airport how they are uh with the people he has cream in his coffee and it tastes different and it's just it's just interesting to see like you, because you can see how they were traveling, getting from place to place, flying in these planes, and uh, uh, pretty interesting. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. I, I've never I sent seen it to it. you. I sent yeah, it to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy. It's on YouTube. It's easy to find. Well, you say that now. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look. That's the thing. You got to look. I think it's just called Jimmy Smith documentary. If you just I put that it. in and out. Yeah. All right. So uh, we're in London. It's uh, January of 1966. Should we just jump right in here? Yeah. All right. It's uh, we're WKCR. I'm going to give you actually tell you officially because we're going to be pushing through. It's WKCR FM New York, WKCR HD One, WKCR dot org, and we call this show Deep Focus. I'm Mitch Goldman and Brian Charette's with me, and we are hearing live music from Jimmy Smith Trio. All right, now, now comes the mystery part, because, hmm, okay, uh, yeah, I don't know if we're going to be able to play this. No problem. Hold on, hold on. Maybe, maybe. We're working from this tablet. It's a little bit of a high wire act. you got to switch to Mac, man. No! <laughs> I am, but I'm a Mac guy. Uh-huh. That's, it was the Mac that it, the uh, CD burned failed on but uh-huh. uh i'm trying man i'm trying I'm trying to open with vlc doesn't want to do it all right we might have to go back no to, problem uh, sorry to even suggest this record no i love it video. it's well worth it yeah. all this music is yeah. fantastic by the way apologies to quentin warren and billy hart yeah. but uh take us through uh to Köln, if you will sure um this is going to be December 4th, 1969. Um, Jimmy Smith on organ, Eddie McFadden on guitar, Anthony Crosby on drums. This is a nice side, too. I'm checking this out pretty hard. Ode to Billy Joe is first. A, a smash hit. 
another yeah. one of those radio smash hits. I love at the this time. song. Yeah, she had a very sad life, right? Do you know her history? Uh, I, one hit wonder, as far as I know, yeah, Bobby Gentry, I, right? Yeah, I think she. You know, I'm not. I can't remember exactly, but I watched like a documentary on her life, and uh, it seemed a little tough. And then uh, another huge hit that um, that Sonny Rollins played the uh, the soundtrack to the film. What's it all about, Alf? I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that at all. Uh, stick around WKCR and you find mm. out all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I didn't know that. All right. Let's jump in. We are in Köln at the Gelsen, Gelsenisch. Man, you can sing this very well. Oh, boy. Got you fooled. All right. <laughs> it's WKCR. Seems to think. Okay. Seems to think. There it comes. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice job. Oh, what man. did you do? No idea. Sorry about that, folks. Thanks for staying with us.
Oh, don't worry. We're going to come right back to that one. I promise. But uh, let's tell you first, you're listening to Deep Focus on WKCR. I'm your host, Mitch Goldman. So fortunate to have Brian Charette here in the studio with me. I'm fortunate to be here. I'm fortunate that you even want to talk to me about this. (laughs) I love talking to you about this stuff. I like to talk to you about it, too. You get in there, man. Like, not to compare. (laughs) <laughs> maybe too much <laughs> maybe there some of the guys asked me to talk to you about this <laughs> getting some help no <laughs> <laughs> they have to get in line <laughs> but uh no 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 you always every you, time we do one of you, these you you no 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 <laughs> no you, you no you <laughs> you this guy let me tell you this guy right here um, no, you uh, always do have some next level information and ideas on this stuff. Well, I've... we often are talking about something that I'm researching at the time. That's when you we ask me what I'm into. I'm telling you what I'm into at the time. You know, so this is what I've been like checking out lately. And we were talking. I just got a record. Pl- I didn't have a record player for years, and I've been buying all of these records. Not obviously what we're listening to, but I've been buying all his records on on wax and checking it out. And Brian Charette talking about the incredible Jimmy Smith. Oh, yes. This was part two of three parts from Monday, January 9th, 2023. And uh, there's another part. So I'm going to see over at part three. But before we go over there, I'm going to ask you I'm, something I'm really curious. I get all these statistics on who's listening to Deep Focus. They're not complete, but I see we have listeners in over 60 countries, which is amazing to me and wonderful. Not a lot in each country. So, well, I always say, you know, spread the word. Let some folks know that we're doing this because uh, most people... Even people that like this music don't know. So we're trying to reach them. But also, I'm going to give you an invitation to email me. It's deepfocusnow at gmail.com. Deepfocusnow at gmail.com. I'm curious how and when you listen to Deep Focus. Do you listen in the car? Do you listen on headphones? Do you listen at home when you're making dinner? Do you listen when you're trying to fall asleep? I'd love to hear anything you have to say. So, Hit me up at deepfocusnow at gmail.com. Okay, I'm going to see you over at part three, January 9th, 2023. Brian Charette on the topic of the incredible Jimmy Smith. <laughs> 